What's up guys, it's Dalmatter here, and today we are going to be reacting to Forgotten Weapons, P90, FN's Bullpup, PDW. So, never seen this channel before. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I have seen this channel before. I've never reacted to it before. Um, and people said I should check this one out. I don't know why the P90 specifically, but people wanted me to check it out. Um, that being said, it's kind of weird that they considered the P90 a forgotten weapon. Because um, it's like, probably one of the most popular weapons in video games in terms of like, just being popular to like toss in your game. Like it feels like every game has a P90, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe this uh, guy does more than just actual forgotten weapons. Maybe that was just the original name of his channel. But anyway, link to the original video down below and let's jump into it. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and uh, today we're getting to take a look at a gun that I've wanted to look at for quite some time. This is an FN P90. PDW, personal defense weapon. Uh, I will point out that this is in fact a registered post sample uh, machine gun. This is an actual P90, not a semi-auto civilianized uh, PS90. So we have, the, the way you can really distinguish that from there is the short little barrel. Now, the P90 was developed as, as I said, a personal defense weapon in conjunction with a, a pistol, both chambered for a cartridge that was intended to be able to penetrate body armor. Specifically, this, was, this went into development in the mid-late 1980s at FN, and it actually predates the official NATO request for this system. So it's unclear to me if FN had some foresight that this was going to be coming from NATO, or if it was something that they saw a need for independently and started to develop. Ult Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me with either one. I don't know too much about FN, um, but... The, the government, so much of it's a revolving door with, like, the military-industrial complex, right? Get into the politics of that, but, yeah, it wouldn't... Either way, it wouldn't surprise me. Ultimately, what really got this, this gun going was the NATO request for this style of firearm. Anyway, uh, when I say that this was intended to be able to perforate body armor, that is specifically Russian military body armor. The concern in NATO at the time, and presumably in Belgium a few years earlier, in the 80s, was... Uh, the Russians are going to attack Western Europe and they're going to drop all sorts of paratroopers behind European lines and the standard, the, the Russian paratroops are all going to be wearing body armor that is titanium plate and some Kevlar. And <laughs> Man, if only they knew. I guess the Soviet Union, as bad as it was, probably wasn't as much of a basket case as modern Russia, although, you know, that, that they definitely were a basket case too, but like so much of, like, I guess this is a year old, uh, well, it says one year ago, which means it could be like a, a one year, 364 days. But um, yeah, how bad Russia's performed in the recent conflict. How little we knew that we had to worry so little. And a 9mm pistol round won't be able Nuke's to... Nuke's still an issue, though, and obviously. So you're going to have all of the behind-the-lines rear echelon NATO troops, the truck drivers, the supply clerks, the administrative guys, who are all equipped with 9mm pistols or perhaps submachine guns, are going to be unable to do squat against uh, this flotilla of Russian paratroops. So what we'll do instead is we'll come up with a requirement for a very compact, handy, self-defense weapon using a cartridge that can penetrate that body armor. And so the way you do that, in if you want to keep a small... Also, it's so sleek looking, gun, it looks like it's from the future. You increase armor penetration by making the projectile small in diameter and high velocity. Uh, give it an armor uh, hardened core and the trade-off here is it will be able to go through a hard surface like body armor but it's going to be pretty limited in the amount of damage that it will actually do to a target after it goes through that armor that's that's the trade-off um, the cartridge will be less effective on an unarmored target than standard nine millimeter ammo but it will be more effective on armor so uh, like i said fn put this gun into development in i think it was 1986 uh, it was launched formally in 1990, just a year after NATO formally requested this sort of armor-penetrating capable PDW style of weapon. Uh, that NATO request came in 1989. It looks like it'd be of so course, awkward to hold, though. The thing though. that really jumps out about the P90 is it's a very unusual, distinctive-looking firearm with a very unusual creative... So, one, it looks like hyper-futuristic, right? Like, it's just so curvy. It looks like it's from, like, 50 years in the future, like something you'd see in, like, a... Um, like, I don't know what the term would be, like a near-future sci-fi movie, right? It's super sleek looking. But also, 
it just seems like it would be super awkward to handle. Like, how how are you supposed to hold that? It, like, it just fe- it feels like it would be, like, really awkward. Uh, anyone that's ever handled one, let me know. Like, are they awkward to handle? You know, magazine system uh, with a 50-round magazine that lies parallel along the top of the gun. So let's take a closer look at this. Let's take a closer look at the cartridge and talk about what is new and what is just kind of hiding inside the P90. For all of the swoopy, high-tech, futuristic look of the P90, especially in 1990 when it was uh, released onto the market, this is actually mechanically a pretty darn simple gun. This is, in fact, simple blowback. Uh, There is no locking system. It really doesn't need a locking system because it's a very small cartridge. The most mechanically interesting part of this to me, of course, is the magazine. So our magazine catch is right here. There's two of them, one on each side. Pull those two back, and we can then lift the magazine up and out of the gun. It is a translucent polymer mag, so you can very easily see through it and see how many rounds are in it. Uh, Just for comparison's sake, that is 5.56 NATO. That is 5.7 by 28 millimeter. Now, when this cartridge was originally designed, it was designed by a couple of engineers at FN, uh, one Jean-Paul Denis and Marc Nuforge. And unlike a lot of cartridges being developed today, they didn't adapt this from anything else that existed. The 5.7 by 28 is a completely unique cartridge, doesn't have any parent case. Uh, has a couple interesting characteristics to it. The the case itself is perfectly straight walled. The rim is just slightly rebated, and the cartridge case is actually covered with a very thin polymer layer uh, to aid in basically lubrication, in extraction, and in feeding in the magazines. Typically, a cartridge will have a very slight taper to it. That is, in fact, the case with 5.56, which you may or may not be able to actually see with the bare mm-hmm. eye. Uh, But that that taper simplifies or eases extraction, because as soon as the cartridge moves back just a little bit, now, because it's tapered, the cartridge case is no longer in direct contact with the chamber. Well, on a perfectly straight-walled case like the 5.7, that doesn't happen. So they have a a chemical lubricant on the case that that takes the place of, of that taper. I suspect the lack of taper was in order to be able to stack 50 of these up like so, in the magazine uh, without needing any curvature. Now, uh, when these are in the gun, the cartridges are pointing out to the side, and they feed through a very interesting rotary mechanism here. So it catches and pulls it in. It must move pretty quickly, because there aren't these... There's our top round, and that's in the position that's going to feed into the gun. Uh, So normally the magazine sits like this, and the bolt's going to come in, push that straight into the chamber. However, when I push the next round in, you can see that that first one rotates 90 degrees. And now, let's put a few in so you can see in the magazine body. So there they are, lined up in the magazine, and then you have this space. I was completely thinking of this the wrong, I thought that was like how it got to the barrel. Um, I didn't realize that was like the loading mechanism. Okay, okay. Basically turntable. I was like, how fast does that fucking thing spin? But yeah, if you're loading it, I guess that makes sense. That takes the cartridge and rotates it 90 degrees like that. This is based on a patent by uh, a gentleman named Hill uh, who developed this in the 1950s. FN took a look at it in the 60s, opted not to build uh, Hill's style of gun. Uh, But they kept it in mind, and his patents are referenced in the FN patents for this magazine. Uh, This magazine, by the way, was designed in 1989 as part of the, the gun development. And it is, the patent on it uh, is registered to another FN engineer by the name of René Prédézé. I think I'm pronouncing that right. So uh, if you're interested in the origins of this system, I have a video on a hill uh, system uh, where this came from. So I'll link that at the end of this video. You can check it out. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, once we uh, have the cartridge rotated into position, then it's just an easy matter of pushing it straight into a chamber. So we will come back to the mechanics in a moment, but for now, the ergonomics, this has two grips like this, very close to each other. Your thumb is, in fact, in the trigger guard. The safety lever is located down here. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Like, how do you hold this thing? It just seems so, like, awkward. One for semi-auto and A for full auto. And it's got these little uh, knurled or serrated cuts on it. 
so that you can easily manipulate it, whether you're shooting it left-handed or right-handed. And then, of course, there's also a chunky built-in hand stop. This is integral to the main body of the gun, so it can't crack off or anything, uh, which is rather important because your front hand is very close uh, to the muzzle there, owing to this having a rather uh, stubby barrel. Now it's not actually that short of a barrel because this is a bullpup style of firearm. So the barrel comes all the way back to here. Uh, it is, uh, I should have looked up the exact number, it's about a 12 inch barrel. 10.4 um, inches. Uh -huh. The civilian ones with a 16 inch barrel come out to about there. Anyway, um, because of the short overall configuration of the gun, they don't have iron sights because the sight radius would be very, very short. Instead, they have a variety of different optics mounted on this sort of buttress assembly up here. Uh, this particular one is the USG version, which has an, a non-illuminated reticle, but there's red dot versions, there's, there are versions like um, uh, reflex sight versions and, and others. Uh, this also has some Picatinny rail on it, so that lights or lasers could be mounted. And you know what? I kind of like this optic. Uh, it's a nice visible dark black reticle, a large outer ring. You've got your sort of three three bars in there, and then a center ring with a very small center dot. Um, also, who's looking through the reticle on a gun like that? You gotta go full Rambo. <laughs> I, I, I guess, like, on the, on the semi-auto, it makes a lot more sense, but, like, the, the people, like, the, the intention for this gun seems like it was, like, uh, almost like a close-quarters combat type gun, so I, like, no, I mean, I guess you are, like, you know, you're going around the corners and stuff. I don't even know if that's accurate. Like, the holding it just seems so weird. Like, this just seems like it would be such a weird gun to hold. Should be something fairly easy to shoot with. But again, this is specifically the USG version. I'm not going to try to cover all of the other variations. Rounding up the last of our controls, we have the charging handle, which is also ambidextrous. I should mention, uh, should be maybe obvious at this point, all of the controls are ambidextrous. This ejects out the bottom back here. So uh, very nice for compact quarters, great for left-handed people like me. Um, your charging handle simply opens the bolt up back there. It is non-reciprocating, so it stays forward when you're shooting, doesn't get in the way. Disassembly is very easy. We have a big old button right here. Push that, and you can pull the front assembly off the gun. So this is the barrel. We have our charging handle. This is the charging handle, the spring, to reciprocate the charging handle. And the optic mounted here. The optic is on fixed to the barrel itself, so you don't have any sort of zeroing issues as a result of disassembly. We can then drop the bolt assembly out the front of the gun. Uh, dual recoil springs. This is a, like I said, a simple blowback gun. So what keeps this locked is just the mass of this bolt. It is also hammer fired. So there's our firing pin back here. And uh, with an eye towards the full auto operation, FN included a bolt bounce. Uh, they call this a rate of fire stabilizer. What this extra little weight does is actually counteract bolt bounce. So with an unlocked gun, uh, you have a hard metal part here and a hard metal part on the barrel, and when the bolt comes forward uh, and hits the barrel, it has a tendency to bounce back slightly. This can interrupt the rate of fire. It can also potentially cause malfunctions. This happened on the M16 at okay. one point during its development. So it just tr it just transfers that extra inertia into this and then it just slides back and yeah. That makes sense. It's smart. Development before it was remedied. The the issue being if it if the hammer is dropping just as the bolt bounces back out of battery, the hammer may not strike with enough force to set off the cartridge or it might not hit the firing pin at all and causes a stoppage. So this acts basically like a dead blow hammer. Other than that, we don't really have anything fancy on here other than the various contours to make it properly fit the gun. So there's an extractor at the top, there's a plunger ejector at the bottom, and that's pretty much it. The rear tail on this guy holds the butt plate of the gun in, so once the bolt is out we can slide the butt plate up and off, this little hole that fits in there. And then we have a fire control group here in the back. This has a little lever in it right there. Lift that lever up against spring tension and we can pull the fire control group out. This looks very much like a Steyr Aug fire control group. It is all polymer, uh, hammer fired, 
right there. So we have an auto sear here, and then our actual trigger is this piece. When I pull this backwards, it releases the hammer to go up. So the way this works in the gun, we have our trigger here, which is connected to this uh, looped metal rod, which is going to come all the way back. There we go, and you can just see it, the two ends right there. Those two ends, there and there. For the visionaries who think... And that is... Like... So much of this just seems like so high tech for the time. I mean, I guess we're only talking about like 40 years ago, but like still, it, it, it's just like, yeah. Just the design. Yeah, I, I, th I think I'm being just like thrown through a loop because it's so sleek looking that my brain's like tricking me to think it's like more advanced than it is. Cause like it is pretty simplistic design, but it's also like super smart. It's like, uh, it's not like over engineered like I feel like a lot of things are when you get like really advanced stuff it's just like very simple concepts but designed in like a very intelligent way sit here and here in essentially well in this part of the fire control group so when it at first the bolt has to go into battery which trips that then the hammer can be released when the trigger goes back so if you're in full auto and you're just holding the trigger back, what actually fires the gun is this, the auto sear. So the hammer is locked back until the bolt is back in battery, at which point it trips the auto sear and lets the hammer up with the correct timing. So that's how that all works. Like, like this is what I'm saying. Like, it's just the fact that like this stuff happens so quickly, right? Because you're talking about like a fully auto gun. And it's all like all this mechanical stuff is just happening so quickly. Um, like when he's doing it slow, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But then you think about it, it's like the rate of fire on this thing just makes it like mind blowing. It's like, it's gotta be designed so well for it to have that rate of fire with like the mechanisms that it does. And the rest of the frame here is basically just a polymer shell. Uh, we've got a few moving bits like the, the safety and the trigger bits in there. But the rest of this is just a whole series of screws that hold the two halves of this together. Ultimately, it would take 13 years before NATO actually held a trial on this RFP that they put out, uh, largely, I think, because for a long time, the P90 was the only, uh, the only firearm that was submitted that met the criteria. Of course, the other contender that we are all familiar with today is H&K's MP7. That came out in 2002, and it was in 2002 that NATO actually held trials comparing the two guns head to head. Ultimately, they found not surprisingly, the MP7's 4.6 millimeter cartridge was more effective at armor penetration. FN's 5.7 millimeter cartridge was had better terminal effectiveness after, or if it didn't have to penetrate armor. Uh, the test that's kind of fascinating because it was literally designed to penetrate armor and not do much damage, right? Because they were more worried about getting through the armor. And then it's literally, well, I don't know if it's been replaced, but it, it, it literally got beat out in that one category. Came down on the side of the P90, although not by a lot, and the disagreement within the testing committee resulted in nothing being formally, officially adopted by NATO. <laughs> what we haven't. We need a gun. We can't agree on which gun, so we're just not going to get a gun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Instead, our widespread adoptions by generally smallish sorts of organizations of both guns, but of course we're talking about the P90 here. Uh, P90 has been widely adopted by a lot of police forces. Um, the US Secret Service uses it. Uh, what's interesting to me is that it's a gun that was developed to arm truck drivers and supply clerks. And there's only really one country that has used it for that purpose, and that is Belgium, where it was designed. Okay. Well, they did. I thought it was going to be like South Africa or something, because South Africa's fucking wild, man. I would, I would not be surprised at all if it was from South Africa. Buy them for exactly that reason. Virtually everybody else, purchasers of the P90 have been either police departments or more, you know, in a military sense, they've been special operations teams, small forces, highly trained. I'm guessing using for I it really interesting. close quarter combat. I'm not entirely sure what judgment to make about this, but I find it very interesting that 
they are purchasing the guns that are not intended to be frontline combat guns. And I, th- uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, come on, like, we, it's definitely usable for that. Um, and like special operations, uh, could you, do you consider that frontline combat? I mean, I guess technically they are on like the front lines, um, or behind enemy lines a lot of the time. Um, uh, but like, you know, you're going into like an enemy territory, you know, you gotta like take over this one building. Like a perfect example of this is like, you know, the SEALs teams going into, uh, take out Osama bin Laden. I, I don't know if they use these, but that seems like it would be a great weapon there, right? You, these guys might have armor on them, close quarters combat, you know. I feel like that would be like right up the alley for this gun. I think, of course, that has a lot to do with the fact that they're they're handy, they're controllable, they're very light to carry. Um, and there's something to be said about a burst-firing 50-round capacity tiny submachine gun. So uh, it's been very interesting to take a look at this mechanically. I would love to do some shooting with it. So, in fact, we are going to do exactly that. And tomorrow, we're going to be taking this out on the range so that I can actually get some trigger time on it. So, join me again tomorrow for that. Uh, A big thanks to Woody's Weapons and Sienna Armory for providing me access to this full-auto post-sample P90. Uh, Hopefully, you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Yeah, so that was really good. I I was kind of amazed at how, like, simple the technology is behind it. it. It's It's one of those things where it's like, it's engineered very well so that like very simple concepts make it work. Uh, I was honestly expecting, you know, you see the P90 and it looks so futuristic from the outside and like you're expecting it to be like, I don't know, fucking magic underneath, I guess. Like, I don't know what I was expecting, but then like he takes it apart and it's, it's like not that complicated. It's just very well designed. Um, yeah. So, also, I don't know why it's on the channel called Forgotten Weapons. It's a very cool weapon, but it's also probably one of like the most iconic guns of the last like half century. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.